page 531. Page 531. Say what a wonderful Savior.
page 526. Page 526. Who looks at the last song if you all can? Let's sing Victory in Jesus. <laughs> That song that we sang, uh, number 447, there was a phrase there in the second stanza that I appreciated, and, and it said, uh, man may trouble and distress me, in the, in the third verse, excuse me, but will dry, but man may trouble and distress me, twill but drive me to thy breast. Life with trials hard may press me, heaven will bring me sweeter rest. We, you know, we can have troubles being persecuted in, uh, because of our faith in Christ, 
But what the world doesn't understand, it's not going to get rid of Christians. Uh, man has tried. They've tried to destroy the Bible, tried to, to run out Christians. What does that do? It just drives us closer to Christ. <laughs> that increases our faith. What a blessing to know that we can go to him, we have that hope, we have that refuge. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we want to remember those that are away. Remember Cutter and Lorraine and their family visiting Lorraine's parents, and uh, um, just hold them up in prayer in their travels as well. Um, Brother Dawson, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to see everybody here. And good to have Cameron with us. And praise the Lord. I know your family is very excited to have you here. So. Amen. All right. Um, let's see, I did have an announcement. If I stand here long enough, and if you look at me hard enough, I might remember. No, that wasn't it. It was uh, something else. Oh, well, probably about the middle of sermon here I'll remember. And if I do, I'll, I'll mention it, okay? All right. Well, it's, uh, ah, it came to me. All I had to do was get my mouth moving here and my brain engaged, okay? Uh, we have tickets for the Andersons to fly up from Oklahoma City for the missions conference and for the Burbages to fly from Nova Scotia. And so praise the Lord for the donations that have been made for that. And uh, uh, so uh, it's shaping up. Keep, the, keep praying for the Neonus that maybe they can get their visa and be able to come here for the missions conference too. Even if it's at the last minute, we'll take it, right? And uh, we'll be glad to have them here. But... Um, and also, I understand that Tim and Annette want to be Tim and Annette want to be joining us here, and so they'll be here with us as well. And I've spoken to Brother Smoot, asked if he could be sure and be here, and he's gonna, uh, he thinks that's gonna open up in his schedule, so he can be here. So uh, should be a good time of uh, talking specifically about missions, and I've got some plans for that. And keep our Bible school, our vacation Bible school, in prayer here in just a couple of weeks, and so uh, hold hold that up in prayer as we go through making our last-minute preparations for all of that as well. All right, well, um, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. This is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. This uh, church in Philippi had a very special relationship with the Apostle Paul. They, they took him to heart. They, they, they loved the Apostle Paul. They cared for him, and they kept up with him. Some of their membership joined up with him and followed him around, and, and they would minister to his needs. Um, you know, I thought about that a little bit. The Apostle Paul, when he labored in the Word, he had people that were around him that were taking care of him so that he didn't have to worry about, you know, what's he going to have for lunch? What's he going to have for this? And, and that sort of thing. Though he did labor with his hands, and, and, and in many ways the Apostle Paul supported those that were ministering to him, he had people that were ministering to his physical needs, 
and together they worked in doing the Lord's work. Then the Philippian church got involved in that. And if we want to talk about missions, the Philippian church was mission-minded in that they, they supported that missionary, uh, the Apostle Paul, and um, in, engaged in that work together with him. And as Paul writes this letter to them, you can see that his love for them is brought forth in this as well. And he has, Paul has a purpose, the apostle had a purpose in doing the Lord's will. The Lord had called him to be uh, a, 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 uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. He who was a Jew, brought up in Hebrewism and, and Judaism, and brought up in the law, the, the Lord called him out of that as Saul, and he was renamed Paul, to go forth, carrying forth the gospel to the Gentiles and all the world. And he shares with the church in Philippi his goal in his life, what he lived for, what motivated, motivated him. He definitely lived an extraordinary life. If we try to trace out his travels, he was on ships, he was on the road, he was traveling from this place to that place, living the life of, of Christian excitement, right? Being stoned in this place, being shipwrecked in that place, being run out of town, lowered out of the wall in a basket in that place, left for dead and you know here and hated of the people in most every place he went, except for those that received the gospel, of course, who loved him dearly. But he lived an extraordinary life and, and many stories to tell. And he starts to share some of this with the, the church in Philippi. What the Apostle Paul was able to accomplish for the sake of the gospel is unparalleled. In, in the writing of the books that are in the New Testament, the sharing forth of the revelations that were given to him by God, putting it down in pen and parchment, if you will, uh, for us to have and preserve for us unto this day through the inspiration and, uh, of the Holy Spirit and the preservation of the Word of God, and all of this preserved for us. And yet there was, it's interesting to look at what motivated him, what kept him going through all of that. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to begin re reading in verse 1 here. So follow along here in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. So he's given them some warnings here. Beware of these that are going to be false teachers, especially those that are the Jews of the circumcision. He said, you know who we are, who have trusted in Jesus Christ, have separated ourselves unto Christ. We are that that has been separated unto Christ in the Spirit, having no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after 
if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here we get a glimpse of what motivated the Apostle Paul, what, what uh, fueled him as he went forth. It starts out, as I said, with a general warning about the concision and now this is speaking about the Judaizers, those who, who are going around to these newly formed churches and preaching, no, 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 you have to do the law. If you're going to be saved, you've got to keep the law. You've got to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. You've got to keep the law. And this was a big problem in those days, and Paul warned them, don't listen to them. It's the, the law was a schoolmaster to teach us that we're incapable of being saved by what we do, our salvation is through faith and faith alone. It's a gift of God that we receive by faith. And so he was warning them, be careful of these that are going around preaching this. And they were, they were glorying in the flesh, the things that you do. Paul said, now if anybody's got a right to glory in the flesh, it would be me. I, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews uh, and uh, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, zealous, even to the point that he had persecuted the church, persecuted those that had uh, broken away from Judaism to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to take that next step to follow after that which the law, in fact, was showing them, that they needed the shedding of the blood for the covering of their sins, not the work of uh, that, that they could accomplish, but that Christ had accomplished everything for them. Paul said, as, as a Jew in the works of the flesh, I was persecuting that, that whole movement, all of, the, all of the, the Christians. I was persecuting them. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. But said, uh, the Apostle Paul said, I counted all of this as dung. In other words, ready, all of that past, all of his accomplishments of the past, he took and he set it aside. That was now something to be thrown in the trash heap in the valley of refuse. And around Jerusalem, there was a valley where they threw all their trash, all the refuse that got hauled out of the, all of the honey buckets that got hauled out of Jerusalem would get dumped out there, right? And Paul said, that's where it goes. All of those things that I thought were gain unto me, the works of the flesh, that's where that belongs. I count that as dung, that I may now go forth and win Christ. What does he mean by that phrase, win Christ? Well, he explains it. There's several places in the scriptures where the Apostle Paul uses the example of a foot race. You know, being in a race like a marathon or a sprinting race or something like that. He describes that, he uses that to describe the life of a Christian. During the race, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, we lay aside the weights, that so e the weight of sin that so easily besets us. So a runner that's going to go out here and run the Equinox Marathon in, in September or October, whenever it is, um, they, they don't take a, a five-pound barbell in each hand and go run 23 point some odd miles, right? They, they want to they have the lightest shoes. They don't want to have any extra weight so that they can run farther faster. In, in our Christian life, we want to set aside the weight of sins, the things that encumber us, the things that are going to hinder us, whether they be possessions, associations, relationships, those things that are going to hinder us in our, in our goal of serving, knowing and serving Christ. Paul said, I, I, I lay that aside, that I might win Christ. In a race, we set aside those weights, and at the end of the race, we're running the race for the prize, right? We run the race anticipating a prize at the end, the runner does. Hebrews 3.14 that we just read, he said, I press toward the mark, the mark, the finish line, that line that's drawn, that mark. I press towards that mark 
for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God is what keeps pressing him forward, looking and anticipating something at the end of this earthly life, something that's greater than anything that he's ever done in the past. You know, all of his accomplishments through his education, feet, uh, sitting at the feet of, uh, was it Gamaliel, the, the great instructor of the law, as a Pharisee and all of the, the distinction that came with being you know, an honored graduate of the, the school of the Pharisees and a, a disciple of a, a very esteemed instructor and wise man, he, he says, I, I, I set that all aside, that I may press forward to a new mark, the mark that is the, the, the prize, the reward of the high calling of Jesus Christ. What motivates us? What are we looking for? What are we anticipating in life? Is it a, you know, a, a good dinner at the end of the day? Well, that's a short-term goal. That's, that's a good thing to have. It's a blessing to have. Is it you know, a, a retirement or is it a, a, a home or is it, or is it you know, some picture we've got in our mind of we have arrived. Now I've got everything. I don't need anything else. You now we're, we're told in, in Revelation chapter 3 about the church in Laodicea. That's, they had arrived, they thought. They thought they had need of nothing else. Paul says, I keep pressing on, and I have not yet attained. I have not apprehended that for which I am pressing forward uh, for. I've not come to the finish line. I've not received the prize. I've not apprehended that which I press on for. You know, as a Christian... It's nice to have blessings, it's nice to have comforts and things like that, but that's not our prize. Maybe for the rest of the world, but we can't get sucked into that mindset. That's not the prize. The prize awaits us through the calling of Jesus Christ. There's something we're looking forward to. What is the prize of our Christian lives? B.H. Carroll, a man that uh, he was a preacher in Texas in the late 1800s, uh, he had fought in the Civil War, in fact, um, a great, uh, great Bible scholar, and, and uh, he has some great commentaries. He wrote, what then is the goal, in reference to the, what is our Christian prize? What is the goal? It is the state of the resurrection from the dead, and includes both complete sanctification of the spirit and glorification of the body. There's something that we're looking forward to, right? How many people... I think the older people get, the more they make reference to, I can't wait till the Lord comes. Uh, even so now, come, Lord Jesus. And, you know, when the Lord, if the Lord chooses to take me home right now, that's fine with me. And the older we get, the more we tar start to talk like that, right? But that's our prize, is it not? Is that not what we're looking for? Is that not what's there? Is the res our resurrection and our time to be with the Lord? B.H. Carroll continues on and says, Paul had not yet attained either one, and that is the complete sanctification of the spirit and glorification of the body. What is the prize? It is that which is to be won. As Paul said, that I may win or gain Christ and be found in him. At that great judgment day, when we stand before the Lord, we want to be found before him. Here, the winning of Christ or the prize is not merely justification by faith when one first believes. That's not, that's not the end. We don't get everything we need the moment we're saved. We have salvation. It can't be taken away. But there's more. There's more that we anticipate. B.H. Carroll says, Here, the winning of Christ or the prize is not merely justification by faith when one first believes but getting to him where he is now and being completely like him in both soul and body. It is that state in which the final judgment finds us, attaining to the resurrection from the dead, means attaining to the state of the resurrection from the dead, and not merely the act of being raised. It is quite important that we know when the salvation of the soul is complete and when sanctification of the soul is perfected, 
It is only on the other side of death that the spirits of the just made perfect are seen. Now, some people will struggle with this and say, well, no, wait a minute. When we're saved, we have everything we need. True. But there's more. <laughs> there's more that Christ has for us, and that's to be with him in heaven. And that's the ultimate purpose of it all, is it not? That's why he created this universe and created people and gave us a choice so that he, there would be a people that would choose him so that we can be glorified with him in heaven. And when we're saved on this earth, we still have this corrupt body of the flesh. And we anticipate that time when we have that incorruptible, when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and we shall have glory with him and in his presence. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. I haven't apprehended that yet. I don't have that yet. I'm still on the flesh. I'm still on this earth. So I press forward. I keep going. This is what motivated the Apostle Paul each and every day to endure what he endured, to, to go forth and, 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 and serve the Lord the way he served and to seek the Lord the way he sought, uh, sought the Lord. And this is to be our motivation as well each and every day, not to take our eyes off of that prize now, we don't gain that prize by works, okay? We know it's through faith, but we're, we're not there yet, so we keep pressing on, looking forward to it, anticipating that reward that's there for us. B.H. Carroll continues, he says, As long as life has a lesson to be learned or a discipline to be endured, the race of the soul is not run nor the goal reached. By one fact, we positively know when the soul discipline is ended. It is precisely at that time when it is passing over the line where accountability to judgment ceases, and the final judgment takes cognizance of the deeds done in the body. No soul, good or bad, is judged on account of what it does after the death of the body, but it is judged for all the deeds up to that event. Therefore, the goal of the soul is the death of the body, and the goal for the body is its resurrection. If it is raised in dishonor, the second death, right, the prize is lost. If it is raised in honor, glorified like the body of our Lord, the prize is won. And the Apostle Paul says, I'm not there yet because I don't have my glorified body, so I'm going to keep pressing on until I get one. <laughs> I'm going to keep going until I get that glorified body. He had the promise of the body, the glorified body, through, through the salvation, the, the, through the faithfulness of God. And when we're saved, nobody can take us out of God's hand. But there's an aspect of our salvation that we don't have yet when we're saved on this earth. And that is we're not in the presence of God in a glorified body in heaven. So we keep pressing on. As B.H. Carroll continues to say, you can thus understand Paul's words, not that I have already obtained or am already made perfect. He had not yet laid hold on all the things for which Christ laid hold of him. When Christ apprehended Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus, he laid hold of him for more things than Paul had yet laid hold of. In other words, when Saul encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, and the Lord said that uh, he had called Paul or Saul and said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And, and, he, and the Lord had sought for him and Saul surrendered to him and, and was then called, was later on called Paul. When, when, when Paul first encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't have a full picture of everything that God had in mind for him. He had not yet fully apprehended the work that the Lord was going to call him to do until such time as the Lord called him home to be with him in glory. And even at this time, the, the Apostle Paul probably had a lot better understanding of that, but through that understanding, he realized, I haven't yet obtained that for which the Lord's got reserved for me in heaven. The race was not yet run over the whole course. The goal of the prize were yet to be reached and run. Later indeed, when actually facing martyrdom, he wrote, 
I am already being poured out and have the time of, and the time of my exodus or my departing is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only. And this shows that the goal is the same with all the runners, not to me only. The goal that the Apostle Paul was reaching out for wasn't just for him, it's for all of us. But that goal is for all of them who love his appearing. That goal, if we are looking forward, if we have the hope of salvation, we have received Jesus Christ and we have the promise of God's sure word that we are saved, we look forward to that time when we shall be with him. We look forward to that time when we don't have the, the burdens of this flesh. When all of that's cast away, the sorrow, the suffering, the sickness, the sadness, the, 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 even, even the, the weight of death looming over us, all of that is going to be passed away someday. And we will be in spirit with the Lord and bodily with the Lord in a body that he's created that's glorified and not subject to this curse of sin. If I can see your face today, that means you, aren't, you ain't there yet. <laughs> if you can see my face, I ain't there yet. But it's coming, right? For those that have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for those that haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, what, what is there? There's just the hope of destruction, which is no hope, uh, the promise of destruction and everlasting separation from God and all that is good. What are you left with if you're separated from all that is good, all that is bad? All of the sorrow, suffering, sickness, death, separation from God. That's what the lost, the unbeliever, the scorner, the one who rejects God has left to anticipate. That's their end, that you might say, it's, I can't call it a prize, but that's what they can expect at the end. Yet they are running, 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 not fully aware that that's what awaits them. It's as if, okay, so in the lower 48, they have these bridges that, that when a tall ship goes through, they have to oh, raise up like that, right? The drawbridge. And there are some bridges. There's one that goes across the canal in Cape Cod that, that every time we go across that thing, it's really steep going up, and you can't see the other side. And I'm, it always, in my mind, I picture, okay, this is a drawbridge that's gone up, and there's no signs, and we're just going to get to the top of this and pew, fall off the end into the ocean, right? If you ignored all of the warning signs of a drawbridge and you just kept going while it was up, that's what would happen, right? And yet the Lord has placed us here as one of his churches to put up the warning signs, hey, the path you're on is leads to destruction. That's what you can expect. And yet people just ignore the signs. They blow on through and off they go into the abyss. So many people have ignored the testimony of this church throughout the years. And that's where they are. Paul says we've got something better. We're on a course that the Lord set before us. And we see the light shining in the distance. And we're racing on towards it. And we know it's there. And we know we're going to get there. But then I'm, I'm just going to press on so that when I get there, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So what did Paul do? He, he admits, I haven't yet attained that. I haven't obtained it. He didn't count himself to be already perfect. How many Christians, once they're saved, go about acting as if they're already perfect? <laughs> that's a dangerous combination when you accept the Christ who humbly died for you and don't accept the humility that comes along with it that's a dangerous combination the apostle Paul didn't do that he said I'm not perfect yet I'll be perfect I know it's there I haven't obtained that it's there I haven't apprehended it yet but it's there so I'm pressing on I'm pressing on look at verse 13 it explains um, explains to him, explains to us what he did. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So many people, all of us need to grasp this. So many people are struggling today, even saved people who just can't quite get their eyes off the situation. They can't get themselves unmired out of the past. And the Apostle Paul had a past, didn't he? He had killed or, or caused the death of Stephen and many others, the death and imprisonment of many Christians. He was guilty of that. Do you think he woke up at night sometimes at first thinking about this, seeing the faces in his mind of the people that he had persecuted unto death or they had sent off to prison or their hungry little children because they had no no one to provide for them at home because he had sent these Christians off to prison because they were, they were going against Judaism? Do you think that when the Apostle Paul was um, saved, that all of Jude the people that were in prison somehow got released because Paul got saved? No, that would just make the Judaizers all the more adamant we got to stop this. We've got to look how dangerous this is. Even Saul was saved, or even Saul was turned away from Judaism. He had some baggage. What did the Apostle Paul say? I forgot all that's behind. All that stuff that I did, I counted it as dung. You know, it's good to be able to tell people, it's good to be able to understand. What may have happened in the past is past. What's up to me right now is what I do with the future. And Paul said, what I'm going to do with the past is put it past, and I'm going to press on to the future. You know, there's, there's a lot of good lessons about life that can be had in that statement right there. There's things that we just don't have control over. We don't have control over the past. It's past, it's happened, it's done. We had control of it at a time, but lost control of it, or, or, or mis, misused what control we had. But now we've got the now and the future. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm, looking, I'm pressing forward to the prize. I'm moving forward to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forget the defeats of the past. Don't stay defeated in the mind. Courageously enter into the, to the next battle. You've heard me talk about the stress, post-traumatic stress disorder and things like this. And uh, It's a serious issue in, in our law enforcement, our military, our EMS. Um, things can get so difficult at times. And you can see things that are so stressful, so um, shocking that they stay with you. That happens and it's expected. And we try to help people to be able to deal with that sort of thing so it's not debilitating. You know, you may wake up sometime thinking about this, but it, for some people it just gets to the point where they can't sleep anymore. They seek solace in alcohol, in drugs, and, and none of that ultimately ends up helping. Their relationships fall apart because they're just, they just can't cope with anything anymore. And they're totally bound up in the past. The Apostle Paul says, no, we've set that aside, and I'm going to move forward. And this is so helpful to all of us, to be able to forget those things that are in the past. Yeah, we may have done some horrendous things. It, it, it's a little upsetting to me when a saved person will get to telling stories about their past, and next thing you know, you get two saved people trying to glorify their past before they were saved, and that's kind of hideous. We need to put those aside and be ashamed of them and say, you know what, that's covered in the blood. Done deal, covered in the blood. I don't need to worry about that anymore. The Apostle Paul, I wonder, did he try to go back to any of those prisons and release people that had been imprisoned as a result of his testimony? We don't read about it. We don't know. I suspect he didn't. That's just pure speculation on my part, so don't, you know, just take it for what it is. 
He may have tried in some places, but he was going to make up for it somehow. You know how he chose to make up for it? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others might live. There may be no hope for those that he had damaged, for those that he had killed, those families he had destroyed. There may have been little or no hope for them. He, he probably, I suspect, he left that in God's hands. That, Lord, you saved me. You know who I was. You know the trouble I caused. You know the mess I left behind me. Lord, I'm leaving that in your hands. I'm moving forward in obedience. And there's a good lesson for all of us in that too, isn't there? We can leave the mess we've left behind and trust it to the Lord. Now, of course, if there's consequences and we're accountable to that, we better hold our accountability to that, right? We can't just walk away from obligation. But at the same time, we can press forward, move forward in faith and service to the Lord. What Paul had done in the flesh, his Phariseeism, his zeal, his blamelessness in the law, he counted them all as dung compared to the prize. He had left all of that behind him. And he knew that his past efforts weren't founded on Christ. He knew that his past efforts were his efforts. And as such, they were worthless. After salvation, he got a new goal. He had a finish line before him. And that was to be found in Christ. Not having his own righteousness, but having the righteousness of God by faith. And I would ask this morning, if uh, I would, let me say it this way. If that is not your goal, you're on the wrong path. If your goal is not to be found in Christ, not having your own righteousness, but having the righteousness of God, which is given you by Christ. It's, it's given you by God through Christ. It's a gift of God. If that is not your goal, then you're on, the, you're on the drawbridge that's wide open and you can't see what's on the other side. I'll, let me give you a warning what's on the other side. Death and destruction, eternal death and separation from God. After, after salvation, we have a new goal. We're not perfect on this earth and we're not going to be perfect until our Lord and Savior calls us up unto himself and then, at that time when we get our glorified body, we will be united with him both in body and in spirit. Then we will be perfect. Because God's not going to dwell with anything that's not perfect. So he's going to make us perfect. And we can't make ourselves perfect, but he's going to make us perfect. Then we will have attained. Then we will have crossed the line. Then we will appre have apprehended that for which we have been apprehended. You know, the Lord has apprehended us. He's obtained us through faith. But he has obtained us for a reason. What is the reason? Why, did, why has God apprehended anybody? Why has God saved anybody? Because he wants us to be with him. He wants us to be there and to give him glory and how are we going to give God glory? Well, we're going to be singing, we're going to be rejoicing and all that. But you know what's going to give God glory? The fact that we're there in the first place. The fact that God gave us the opportunity and God was gracious and God was merciful and all we did was receive it, but God gets the glory because it's all of him. Because he is the one that showed forth and extended that grace and that mercy. Just our being there on the other side of the finish line, if you will, gives God glory. And that's what should motivate us to press us forward, to press us on in life, to endure what we've got to endure until we get to that, that place where the Lord, that place that the Lord has apprehended us for. Until then, we forget those things that are behind. We stretch out. I like that in, in um, verse 13. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I mean, running with your momentum and your weight forward and you're just pressing, pressing on, reaching forth. I get 
You know, I love those photo finish, the finish of the racers at the finish line, and they're really close, and the one who wins is the one who's just thrown their body forward. So they break the, the line first. They cross that line first. They're, they're, they're reaching forth, and that's putting it all out there. They're almost pretty much out of control at that point. Some of them lose control. They fall all over the ground because they can't get their balance back. They've reached forth so hard. May we be reaching forth, stretching it, pushing ourselves out there, moving towards that prize, that which we have been apprehended for, to give God glory in his presence. And in the meantime, be glorifying God, reaching out in that way. Press towards the goal. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Being, he begins this letter to the Philippians there saying, Being confident of this very thing. He's got a confidence, right? That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. This is reaching forth being growing, being filled, approve things that are excellent, being sincere, sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, until that time that we're with him, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, not the fruits of wickedness, but the fruits of righteousness, doing that which is righteous, that letting the Lord perform righteous works through us, reaching forth unto that. Look at um, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. We see this idea of reaching forth unto the goal again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. This is reaching forth. Working out your salvation. In other words, not working to get your salvation. That's not the idea at all. Working out your salvation means you keep working throughout your salvation. You keep working until that day when you cross the finish line and you're in glory in your glorified body. When this earthly body is passed away and your soul is separated from it, you work out your salvation. You keep working until that day when, we, when our salvation has everything that, we, that it's been promised. When everything about our salvation is fulfilled. Well, that's an interesting question. A thought just came to my mind. Will our salvation ever be completely fulfilled? If, if the major aspect of our salvation is to be with God forever, will that ever be fulfilled? If we're with him forever and there is no end to forever and our fulfillment is being with him forever our salvation is going to be completely going on <laughs> forever oh, all right enough I, I, I've learned a, a new phrase that uh, sometimes the Lord isn't always in control of my mind because God is not the author of confusion so but hopefully that wasn't too confusing right but that's the beauty of our salvation. It never ends. But there is a line that's been set for us. And that's when this body, this flesh, passes away. And we go on to be with the Lord. And we get to enjoy that forever with him. There is that time. What do we do in the meantime? Forget those things which are behind and reach forth. That takes effort, doesn't it? That takes determination. That takes discipline. Keep reaching forth. Keep moving on towards that mark in the meantime. We know it's there because God's promised it, and we have that promise when we've trusted in Jesus Christ. So what does he say? Keep going forward. Keep pressing on. Work out your salvation. 
How do we do that? With fear and trembling. Fear God. Know that we're going to be held accountable from the day that we're saved until the day that we're uh, raptured and, or, or, or we die on this earth and we go to be with the Lord. We're going to give an account of what happens in between. And our reaching forth needs to be done in fear and trembling. Not taking, saying, oh, I can do anything I want now. I got it made. But in fear and trembling, I'm going to have to give an account for how I've run this course that's been set out for me. From the moment the blood was applied to my life until the moment the, the benefits of the blood are realized, the full benefits of the blood are realized, I'm going to have to give an account for that. And so we reach forth with fear and trembling. We go back to Philippians chapter 3 again, but we go on down to verse 20. Verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, our conversation, our goal, our, that goal is in heaven. And it's from heaven that we're expecting Jesus Christ to come down to us. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Jesus Christ is able to subdue all things, to apprehend, to obtain all things unto himself. And he is the one. That, that's, that's our view. That's our goal. Looking unto heaven. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto heaven from whence we look for the Savior who shall receive us unto himself. We have a prize. We are to forget those things that are behind, let the blood cover that, and move forward in righteousness, in fear and trembling, reaching out for that which God has, uh, uh, has promised us and for which we are apprehended. Let's all stand. We're going to have a song of invitation. And I hope and pray that you can say, yes, I'm on the right path. Yes, I'm running the course, and I hope that we can all be encouraged to reach forth in fear and trembling, putting it out there for the Lord, pressing forth to that prize, so that when we get there, the Lord will say, well done. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. And we have in our congregation, you know, young people that are growing up in church that have to ask themselves this question. Do I understand that I'm a sinner and I need to repent of my sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? When you get to that age when that starts to sink in, when you start to realize this is personal, this is talking about me, I need to be saved, then you need to be saved. You need to receive that. You need to receive the gift that God's given you. And the time to do that is the moment you start to understand your sin and your separation from God and we're all separated from God until such time as we're, we're, we're received that gift of salvation through faith. Until such time as we trust in Christ Jesus, we're separated from him. When that time comes, and if it's right now, then reach forth. Reach forth towards that prize. Reach forth in receiving Jesus Christ. That's the first step of this Christian race is to receive that baton that's been handed to us so that we can keep on going. What shall we sing? Page 537 in the praise hymnal. 537. 